Okay, so here is sort of a quick uh, discussion of section 3.2. Um, it assumes you already watched the 3.1 one, so you thought a little bit about shape. Remember, the important distinction here as we're thinking about data is the difference between data that is symmetric and data that is not symmetric. Um, so first, um, let's talk about the easiest uh, way to measure spread or diversion, dispersion or variation. Um, and so here, let me first just show you a quick data set here. Um, I found this data on the internet, so you know that it's perfect and true in every way. Um, and there we go. Um, so this is 56 lake fish caught in one net in Finland. Again, I got it from the internet, so you know it's amazing and awesome. And the idea is each fish that they caught, um, they measured very carefully the length and the weight. These are relatively small fish. The longest fish was 46 centimeters um, and the heaviest one was one kilogram, 1,000. I guess there's an 1,100 in there. Um, anyway, um, unsurprisingly, longer fish tend to weigh more. That actually matches what we did with the Minitab lab um, a few uh, last week. Um, but you can see here that uh, they measured the length and the weight. This is actually not just an academic problem when you're thinking about fish because it's actually very hard to weigh fish on a boat. Um, and so if you think about how you weigh fish on a scale, right, the one kind of scale, a spring scale, goes like this. Well, how do you think that works when you're out in the open sea, right? Not very well. The other kind of scale we use, the one that's a fancier one like you have in, uh, I don't know, in a chemistry class or something is a balance scale. So you have the two sides. Well, how does that work on the open sea, right? Also not very well. So this idea that we want to estimate the weight of a fish from its length is totally a thing people do. And if you, excuse me, if you ever watch one of those uh, Discovery Channel shows or whatever, you'll see they actually measure the length of fish and they don't weigh fish at all, except in the general sense that they see how much the boat sinks in the water as an idea of how many fish they have. So anyway, here is our 56 fish. Now, the simplest measure that we use to measure fish is called the range. And the range is pretty easy because you just take your largest number and you subtract it from your smallest number. So um, all you need to do is you just find your biggest one, um, which in our case is 46.6 inches, and we subtract our smallest fish, which is 8.7 inches, and they're actually in order for weight, or for our length, I mean. So as we do that, we can see that the range is 37.8 centimeters going from 8.8 .8 to 46.6. So the range is great because it's easy to calculate. However, if you remember last time when we talked about how outliers can mess up our measurements, gosh, one outlier messes up our measurement, right? If we're thinking about income, you know, if Jeff Bezos is in our sample, we're going to get a very different range than if uh, no billionaires are in our sample. So that idea of how one individual can kind of mess up our results um, is sort of uh, key. So I'm going to move this to just a little different format here. I did this so we could see it all on one screen. But here I've just moved and I've just made one big column and I moved the weight over here so that we could just look at the length. So um, if we have the average calculated, and again, that's a pretty easy thing to do in Excel or wherever, um, we can just calculate the average uh, length. And the average here is about 29 and a half. Uh, that's B59. So what we do when we look at standard deviation is we take the length of each fish we take the length of each fish and we subtract from it the mean. Okay, well, that's a pretty easy thing to do. And of course, we want to do it lots of times. So we're going to put that dollar sign in so that the one number scooches, but the other number, the other one number scooches, but the other number doesn't scooch. And again, that one is 20 centimeters smaller than the mean. And as we go down, we're going to see all the rest of the numbers. Okay, so this is the length minus the mean. Okay, and that was pretty straightforward to do, and I there's too many decimal points, but that's okay. Um, and you can see because the fish were sorted in order from shortest to longest, we can see that these differences are getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Here's the ones right around the mean, and now it's becoming positive and getting bigger, 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 and now these ones are way bigger than the mean. Okay, so that's the beginning of the formula. Then if we want to take it the next step, we're going to take that number squared. Okay, so we're just going to take that number and we're going to square it. Okay, and again, no fancy calculations here. We're doing this all in Excel. And now we can see what happens is, right, it gets rid of the negative signs because any number squared is positive 
and it makes the big numbers more bigger, right? And again, that's where this is going to be very affected by outliers, not as much as the range, but still there. Okay, and so you can see that the very first ones have a big square difference. This number gets smaller and smaller. Again, the ones where the difference is not very big, the square difference is not very big. Remember, numbers smaller than one get even smaller -er, um, as you do that, and then they start to get big again. Okay, so that is how you calculate uh, the squared average difference. Then we're gonna just sum that up. And again, here I am just doing the sum command. And that is our sum squared difference. And in fact, in upper level classes, you use that for some other things. And all we're gonna do now is we're going to um, divide that by the number that we have. So again, it's gonna get us an average. So again, there were 56 fish. We're gonna actually divide the number by 55. So we're gonna take that number, divide it by 55. We use n minus one for some technical reasons. The book goes into that detail. All right, so this is the sum of squared differences. And this is the root sum of squared differences. I'm oh, sorry, it's not the root sum, it's the average of squared differences. I just gave away the story. The last thing we do is we take the square root of this first number. And that is our standard <coughs> deviation. Now, sometimes we do use the term variance. Variance is another name for this sum uh, average squared difference. And there are cases where the variance is what we want. But typically standard deviation is what we want. Taking the square root fixes the units, right? We were in uh, centimeters and then the difference between them was still centimeters. When you square it, it becomes square centimeters, which is kind of goofy. And then taking the square root of that gets us back to centimeters. Now, there's a command in Excel to do this, of course. So you don't actually have to do this long process that we just did. You could just do STDEV and then enter in all your data. And if I did it right, we got the same number, yay. Okay, and we just call that S. Okay, so that is um, sort of a way um, that we think about uh, variation. And let me go back here to the slides that we had from before. Um, again, these slides are from Dr. Love, so thanks to her for letting me kind of steal them. So the range is just the difference the variance is this calculation, right? It looks scary, but really you're just taking each number, subtracting it from the mean, squaring it, and dividing by how many there are. In this case, the population does divide by uh, the population size. The variance for samples uh, divides by n minus one. And again, that has to do with bias. And again, it's kind of a technical thing the book describes in more detail. So the standard deviation is just the square root of those. Standard deviations and variances are always positive, and the bigger the number is, the more variation you see. They are strongly influenced by outliers and by having asymmetrical data. They're great if your data is normal. They're not so great if your data is not. Okay, and again, we can calculate a data set here. Um, for this class, we don't really have to do it by hand. You can either do it in StatCrunch or you can do it um, on a spreadsheet, um, but you know, while squaring numbers is super fun, that's not a thing we're gonna really do in this class. So here is another example of that. So again, here's our numbers, here's the mean, subtract, square it, add them up, divide by how many there are, minus one, square root it. Tedious, not hard, all right? And again, the fact that we don't do this by hand, right? Back when I was a student, back in the 80s, um, you had to do this on a piece of paper and it took a long time to do um, we're not going to do that at all really in this class. So enjoy that. Now, when our data is normal, we actually know lots more as a result of the standard deviation. And the main idea of it is that most of our data falls near the mean. And the standard deviation has this nice mathematical property that if you look plus or minus one standard deviation, uh, that's going to have about two thirds of your data. So the 34% rule is that uh, one standard deviation above or one standard deviation below is going to give you 34% of your data. That's 68% together. So again, two thirds of your data is within one standard deviation of the mean. That's most all of it. If you go plus or minus two standard deviations, that'll that's 95%. So sometimes on TV, you'll hear people talk about 95% confident. Um, when you hear people say, oh, the election results are plus or minus 3%, uh, whatever, 
um, that's that same confidence level. If you go three standard deviations out, that's most everything. So 99.7% of your data falls into there. So in a very real sense, we can talk about outliers of a normal distribution by how far away they are from uh, the standard deviation. Okay, um, so again, we can then think about how we uh, think about things. So um, for instance, um, IQ tests uh, that they do are ACT scores. ACT scores have a mean of 21 and a standard deviation of five. ACT scores are normally distributed because they make them have that. That's how they're scaled. So if we said two thirds of students fall between uh, plus or minus five on that number, we can say that a 26 on the ACT is one standard deviation above. We can look at the table and say, oh, well, that's 34% there, um, 13 and a half, 2.4, and just a little bit there. Or we can do it the other way and say 15.9 and a little bit more here, 0.3. Um, but about 16%. So if you're one standard deviation of the mean, if you had a 26 on your ACT, that's the 83rd percentile. And from the normal curve, we can calculate that very quickly. If I went too fast, again, the book goes over this more and your homework will have you go through it as well. All right, this idea that we can think about standard deviation as a distance is one that we're gonna use a lot. So this idea that if we calculate how many standard deviations above the mean or below the mean something is, we can call that a z-score. And again, there's a formula for it, but if you just think a 26 is one standard deviation above the mean, the z-score of a 26 is one. Um, so again, here's an example here. Um, this idea that if we calculate the z-score, that the average height for adult men is 69.4 inches with a standard deviation of three, um, and the mean height for adult women is 63.8. We can use these scores to think about relative heights. So if we say, oh, a man is 73 inches tall, six foot one, a woman is five foot eight, which one is relatively taller? Because these scores get rid of all of the actual details and just turn it into a raw number. So a man who's 73 inches tall is about 1.16 standard deviations above the mean. The woman who is five foot eight is about one and a half standard deviations above the mean. So relative to the population, women are taller. We can also use this for two different variables. So for instance, I'm about uh, 71 inches tall, 70 and a half inches tall. So I'm at right about um, um, half a standard deviation above the mean. Um, and so a half a standard deviation above the mean puts me right at about the 60th percentile. And that's, you know, dealing with height, my height in inches, although if you did it in centimeters or miles or whatever, it would give you the same answer. But if we thought about my weight, we would say, oh, um, I'm about uh, 1.7 standard deviations above the mean for weight. So about 0.6 standard deviations above for height, 1.6 standard deviations above for weight. What does that tell you? It tells you I'm fat. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, but the idea that you can compare variables that are very different in very real ways is what we get from using the z-score like this. Um, from this idea, we can go back to percentiles. You've all seen percentiles before because you take all those standardized tests um, and we can work it out from there. Um, of course, the idea that you're at the 80th percentile means that 80% of the data is less than or equal to. The book goes through details how to calculate that by hand. Of course, we have computers to do that for us. What we do think about sometimes is the idea of quartiles. So quartiles is where we find four of these uh, groups. So if we think of the median, splitting the data into 50% and 50%, that's cool. Um, and then if we take each of the median sides and we split that in half, we calculate the submedians or the first quartile and the third quartile, we now have four equal groups. Okay, so if we go back to um, my fish data here. There we go. Um, we can calculate that for there. So calculating the median is, of course, easy. And our median is 26.5. So again, we might even want to compare that to the mean that we calculated before. Here's the median. We can calculate Q3 and Q1 um, the same way. We could use the quartile command. 
for that. And again, it's pretty straightforward. And I have to put in which quartile we want. So I'll put in, we want the first quartile. First quartile is 23 inches. I put my little dollar sign here. Let me go up here and calculate it again now with the third quartile. And we can now see that Q3 and Q1 are um, our 25th and 75th percentile. If we add into that our Q4, which is our max, and Q0, which is our min, we can then have what we call our five number summary, which expresses sort of the details of our data. All right, we can take that a step further and we can calculate another measure of variation, which we call the interquartile range. The interquartile range is the distance from the third quartile to the first quartile. So Q3 minus Q1, and it comes out with 15.75. Typically, our quartile is um, bigger than our standard deviation, because you remember plus or minus one standard deviation is 68% of our data. The IQR is going to have 50% of our data. So if our data is symmetric, if it is normal-ish, um, we expect our IQR is about one and a half times the big of our standard deviation, and that's what it is pretty close to. Um, and that gives us another measure. The IQR is more useful when, again, you have a lot of outliers. So if your data is normal, if your data is symmetric, then standard deviation is probably what you want to use. If it's not, then IQR is probably what you want to use. Now, we can take that a step farther and calculate what we call the fences. And a fence is the idea of how far away a point should be before it's an outlier. And a fence is 1.5 IQR from the median. Okay, and again, that's annoying to calculate, but again, I have a computer here, so it's not that hard. 1.5 times our IQR. So that's 23 uh, in this case. Again, this is our fish data. So if we took our uh, numbers here and um, our values, if we took 23 and added it to our median, which is 26, that is a number that we would consider to be an outlier. So in our case, our fish data, we don't have any outliers because nothing is beyond the fences, right? An outlier hits a home run and it goes past the fences. In the other direction, the IQR um, is 15. So the fence, again, is one and a half IQRs away from the median. Um, as we do that. So we can write it down here, maybe a little bit more, put some more words, but 1.5 IQRs goes here. So we could have our upper fence is just our median plus our one and a half IQR and our lower fence is our median, our median minus one and a half times the IQR. So again, in this case, there are no fish that are outliers. And if your data, again, is pretty symmetric, we wouldn't expect to see very many outliers that reach this level. Um, we could calculate the z-score the same way and see um, how that compares. Again, now that we have the mean and the standard deviation, we can do that pretty easily for each value. We can say, what is our length minus our mean. Divided by our standard deviation. Again, we're not going to do this by hand very much. And even this sort of calculation, we don't do very much. And as we go, do, 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 we've now calculated the z-score of all of our numbers. And I forgot to do my dollar sign thing. Um, remember, that's why we did that lab. Can do that with the dollar sign. And here we go. So our smallest fish is 2.17, 2.18 standard deviations below the mean, right? Again, if you're using two as your outlier point, then that first fish would be an outlier on the small side. Um, on the plus side, your largest fish is 1.78. Now we know that there are juvenile fish and fish can swim out through the net. So it could be that, you know, something else is going on there. 
But according to our formal rule that an outlier is three standard deviations away from the mean, that's not an outlier. And according to our fence rule, again, it would have to be lower than three to be an outlier. And on this end, the same way, nothing's close to being an outlier. Okay, so those are our different measures of uh, variation. Um, again, the book goes through this in more detail. You'll have some homework to do it as well. So um, there you go.